Welcome, everybody. Uh, so, hello, everyone, and good evening. I'd like to welcome any new participants we have joining us tonight, as well as welcome back any returning participants. Uh, before I introduce myself, I'd like to bring your attention to the poll that should be displayed on your screen. If you could please click on the response that best applies to you. Uh, we're going to have a few polls running in the beginning of the presentation while I give a little bit more information about who we are and what we're doing. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's virtual grand rounds presented by the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. My name is Michael Tarr and I'm a second year medical student at New York Medical College and I'm also the AADMD virtual grand rounds facilitator. So the poll question asks which profession or role do you represent? So I'm just gonna see what we have so far. So when I close the poll, we have joining us 12% of our participants are working at administration, 15% are students, 8% are working in medicine, and 31% dentistry, and 35% others. So you can see we have a very wide range of participants joining us tonight. So the AADMD Virtual Grand Round session seeks to create a space for mentorship and exchange of knowledge and experience between seasoned IDD providers, entry-level clinicians, and future healthcare providers in training with the purpose of building and strengthening the IDD healthcare workforce across a spectrum of experience levels. So to go off on that, I will give you your next poll. And the next poll is, in which, state of, in which stage of your career are you? So whenever you're ready, just please respond in kind to our next poll. So um, at the end of this session, we'll be sending you all a link to fill out a quick survey we've made. It shouldn't take more than five minutes, but it's very important to us that you do fill it out because the feedback we receive through this survey allows us to improve the virtual grand rounds experience and also to hear what future presentations you'd like to have us organize. So the results of our current poll show that 25% of our participants are health professional training, 4% are in their residency, 71% are currently practicing, and 0% are pre-health profession or are retired from their practice. So just one last poll. Feel free to fill it out as I'm speaking. So I'd like you, I would like to, uh, if you would like to view our previous virtual grand rounds presentations with accompanying lecture slides, the first and second presentations should be uploaded onto the AADMD website very shortly. And tonight's presentation should be uploaded within a week or so. In addition, we are working on becoming Continue Education Certified, or CME, so that in the future we'll be able to offer credits for participating in our virtual grand rounds. So just to look at our final poll, um, asking what you hope to gain from tonight's seminar. We have 25% of the participants saying they would like to learn foundational healthcare concepts. 8% are joining for network, for networking um, reasons. 38% said they're joining to gain interprofessional perspectives. 29% said they're joining to gain pearls of information from complex or challenging cases and zero are on for the CE credits, which makes sense because we are still pending getting CE certified. So finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Lynn Takelet, our presenter for tonight. Dr. Takelet earned her DMD from the University of Pittsburgh in 1985, after which she spent 23 years working in private practice as a general dentist. In 2009, she joined the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine and was assigned specifically to the newly developed Center for Patients with Special Needs, where she is currently serving as director. Dr. Takelet is an active member of the AADMD, um, as well as the Special Care Dentistry Association. She is also the faculty advisor to the University of Pittsburgh student chapter of AADMD. 
Tonight, she is presenting on considerations during, during dental treatment for patients with disabilities. Before I hand off the mic to her, uh, I'd like you all to know during the lecture, if you have questions or want something clarified, just use the question feature that you have in the small box uh, that you should have on your screen. Or you can type your, your questions into the chat box. And I will re relay the questions that are immediately pertinent to Dr. Takla and we'll save any other questions for the end of the lecture. And at the end of the lecture, feel, please feel free to use the chat box to exchange contact information with each other if interested. And with that, I will give the floor to Dr. Takelet. Okay, great. Um, so let's just get started. Um, we're going to be talking about considerations during dental treatment for patients with disabilities. And um, I sort of put this together like a little combination of things. And then there's a case presentation at the end. So we can look forward to that. So um, again, sometimes we say we are preaching to the choir when we're talking to each other in this group because we're all very aware of many of the things that are going to be on the first couple slides. But just to you know get us all on the same page, this gives us an idea of what um, individuals with special health care needs are described as physical, developmental, mental, sensory, behavioral, cognitive, or emotional impairment. And, and and or limiting conditions that require medical management. Um, so you know, this is a lot of what we focus on in the ADMD and those of us who manage patients with disabilities. Um, this is a big piece of our, our world. Um, you know, I, often, I, I heard once of a woman, and this was a perfect description of dis who described her practice as a Robin Hood practice. And if you're on here, I apologize for stealing your line. And I loved it because it, it, it was when we were having a conversation about making specialized care a true specialty in dentistry as opposed to you know just something that general dentists can do. And her thought process was in private practice, probably 80% of her practice is neurotypical non-disabled patients. And the other smaller percentage are patients with disabilities of varying types. And you know she emphasized how Often when we treat patients with disabilities, the, the, the payment exchange is not the same rate. And so her comment was akin to the fact that what we do 80 or 90 percent of our practice time helps to or enables us to treat patients with disabilities when we might not be reimbursed by providers the same way. Um, and I thought that was an interesting comment, and I just thought I'd share that with you guys right now. So. And again, if that person is on the line, I appreciate you sharing that thought with me because it made a big difference. What I do here at the dental school is very different than that. Um, you know, we run a center that is exclusively for care of patients with disabilities. Um, so um, let's move along. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the American with Disabilities Act. Um, for dentists, ADA is typically the American Dental Association. So our joke in our class, my didactic class, is this call this the other ADA. So um, the other ADA involves this type of care or enables us to provide this type of care. And one of the things that I always point out to the students is I think we all know the beginning of this definition. Someone who has a physical or mental, mental impairment substantially limits one or more life, major life activity. Um, a person who has a history or record of such an impairment and the one that most folks don't think about is a person who is perceived by others as having such an impairment. So the patient may not realize that themselves. And the other thing that's a sort of a trick question on my test is the fact that it's one or more major life activity. Um, students seem to think that it will take more than one. Um, but that is not the case. So I kind of agree with this. Um, managing or taking care of patients with disabilities and managing their dental problems is sort of an opportunity for innovation and creativity in your practice. Um, I often say that I feel that the patients we take care of make up the largest minority of, you know, of the population of U.S. and that I feel that number is growing. Sometimes I refer to um, our group of patients or those with disabilities as you know, the umbrella, the special needs umbrella that encompasses a very wide range of patients. Um, and I truthfully believe 
that clients can educate us for um, best practices and how to help to take care of their needs dentally, medically, and I often learn things from my patients. Um, and I'll tell you about one of those when we get to the case presentation. So this all comes down to what's your degree of comfort for interacting of of comfort interacting or examining somebody with an obvious disability. I'm going to be honest with you. When I was trained in dental school, that was not something we were taught, and it was it's definitely something that the average dentist my age and older is likely not comfortable with. Um, again, as this becomes more and more popular, and the dental schools are required to provide some sort of education in this area, um, we're hoping to change that trend with you know the younger practitioners and those that are willing to learn. I think I went through two slides. Nope. Okay. So some again, again, this is some common knowledge, but individuals with disabilities are more likely than other patients to report poor communication with healthcare providers. There's a lot of frustration. Many of our patients are nonverbal. Um, a lot of times their care providers or their parents are enduring that frustration themselves. And of course, individuals with disabilities require more time, and um, the reimbursement may not be available. So one of the things we really emphasize are barriers to care, barriers to treatment. Um, and we clump it into four categories, although I'm sure that many of you will think of others. So provider barriers, that's us, right? We're providing the dentistry, the medicine, whatever the health um, treatment is. And um, there's a large, um, in, you know, a large number of insufficiently trained personnel. In our case, it's the dentist and hygienist, and in the case of needing anesthesia, anesthesiologist, perhaps dental anesthesiologist, and then on down the line. Um, you know, again, this is why it's becoming incorporated into the schooling. Um, so patient barriers. You know, the patient doesn't understand maybe why they need to have their teeth cleaned, for example. Why is it important to brush their teeth? They just don't understand the cause and effect of the fact that filth in your mouth, bacterial plaque, causes dental disease. They may not be able to communicate. We already talked about that. They may have mobility issues. Physical barriers. These are at our facility, usually. Um, but it could also be something as simple as the distance to the provider, which you see listed here. Um, in our case, many of our patients travel from three, maybe four hours away, um, and that becomes a big problem. Obviously, we're supposed to comply with what the ADA asks us to in terms of ramps and parking and, and things like that. But sometimes, you know, many practitioners, especially if they have an older building, they're limited by um, what was built at the time. So this becomes a big problem. Financial barriers. Um, I think this is goes without saying, but it's worth mentioning so that it's out there. Um, many states, Pennsylvania being one of them, were from the University of Pittsburgh, like Michael said. And Medicare and Medicaid pays for a limited amount of certain dental procedures. I understand that many of the states that does not um, happen. But um, you know, there are patients who you would think medically should be eligible for some sort of medical assistance. But as you can see on the very bottom of the slide, they may have accumulated too many assets. So this might be somebody who isn't developmentally disabled. They weren't born that way, but possibly they have an acquired disability. And they were a successful, money-making adult, and then they become disabled, and they have too many assets and they may become ineligible for certain services. And they quickly use up their little savings account or kitty or whatever you want to call it. Um, a lot of times when I ask this question to students, they'll say, well, they have medical insurance. What are they worried about? However, I think you guys are probably well aware of the fact that the coverage for medicine and dentistry, even within an MA program, is limited. And the reimbursement is low, generally and many providers do not want to participate. So there's still a financial barrier that exists. So these are some of the provider challenges, um, not just in dentistry, but all across the board. And like we said, reimbursement may be less than um, for routine fees. So here in Pennsylvania, this um, D9920 is actually a um, CDT code, a, a dental um, code that can be used 
for patients who need to be treated with a lot of behavior management or behavior modification. You cannot use this in conjunction with the sedation procedure, um, but it does enable the provider to um, regain some of the money that might be needed. Say, for example, patient requires three providers instead of two or possibly four providers to help hold hands down or two people to be chair-side as a dental assistant instead of one. Um, a neurotypical patient might be able to have their teeth cleaned by one hygienist, whereas a patient with a disability re might require the hygienist and two additional personnel, and the appointment will likely take longer. So the fees would need to be greater, but they're not reimbursed at that rate, and you can use this code in conjunction with that. I'm not familiar with this, um, if this is available in other states, but um, this is what is the deal in Pennsylvania. Lots of coordination with other care providers. Many of you are on this list, probably. If you are a physician or another health care provider, guardian, um, nurse. And I have some things in here about consent. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to put it in the PowerPoint so that you can refer back to it. Informed consent is something that's very real, real to all of us. So there are different types of consent. Um, you know, obviously, if the patient can answer you, if they are self-consent, they can tell you, yes, indeed, I want this done. Implied, the simplest for, uh, example of that is they show up for their appointment. Um, and here's some other details about explicit consent for specific procedures in dentistry. And I'm sure in medicine, we have tons of things to sign to be able to follow through with treatment that needs to be done. And then exceptions, obviously. The reason I brought this up is who can consent? So there are many times that patients that you treat with a disability may or may not be able to consent for themselves. Either their developmental disability doesn't enable them to do that, to, to manage that consent. They can't make difficult decisions, perhaps. Somebody needs to make those decisions for them. Um, so it's more like a pediatric practice, especially in the dental world. You do a lot of communicating with mom, dad, caregiver, in the case may be possibly the caregiver is a sibling or a grandparent. Um, and so then you get into the legalities. What's involved in your state? Do those folks need a POA, a power of attorney? Do we need to get legal documentation for those types of things? And the paperwork side of the equation is much more involved than the dentistry sometimes or the medicine. So it gets a little frustrating. Um, this is just an example of a, a consent. It is not ours. Um, ours is similar, but in there's a section that talks about um, how long the consent is able to be utilized. So it might say only for this day, until revoked by me, or between this date and that date. Um, we have a lot of situations here where, say, mom or dad is at work, caregiver brings the patient, but they do want to be called by phone. And this enables them to um, you know, have this all in writing. Um, again, this is in our form, but it's a sample. So basically, when you come to treatment planning, all patients, not just patients with disabilities, you want to look at the risk versus benefits. Um, in this patient population, that actually has a bigger conversation, usually. So, And this is just a quote I saw once and liked it. At the end of the day, can you honestly say that your treatment will improve the quality of life for your patient, not just dentally, medically, everything, social work, all the way across the table? This is a very important thing for us to look at. Um, you know, there are a lot of high-risk patients that we manage and, um, and treat, and I think this is a big piece of what we decide. A lot of what I focus on when I'm teaching the students is, you know, we can do a lot of really fancy dentistry, but is it appropriate for this patient? So every dental patient, every dental student is taught this series of things. Eliminate disease, manage chief complaints, um, restore dentition or the teeth to normal form and function, and then hopefully somewhere along the line we instill some lifelong prevention behaviors. Um, otherwise, everything we do will fail. And again, here's some sequencing. This does not only apply to patients with disabilities, but all patients. So you want to deal with chief complaints and emergencies, manage disease. 
then get into the prevention and fixing stage. And then what we call recall is when you come back and get your teeth cleaned every six months and follow up on whatever care you need. Lots and lots of treatment challenges in this patient population. You can read through them. So alive is a big issue, swallowing difficulties. Um, I really enjoyed some of the lectures we heard at a couple of the annual meetings the past couple of years about swallowing disorders. So, um, simple things like getting numb. Many of you, I'm sure, have received that wonderful shot on the bottom that gets your entire lower lip and half of your tongue numb. And you are told at the end of the visit, be careful, you'll be numb for a couple hours. How do you explain that to somebody with an intellectual disability? Somebody that just doesn't understand that, you know, that is going to take a while to go away. So it's nice to know um, this product in the corner, for those of you that are not dental oriented, or reverse. Unfortunately, it's a little bit expensive, but it's actually a reversal agent for um, the local anesthetic in your mouth. And it kicks in in about 10 or 15 minutes if it's given in the right site and can help to reverse the symptoms of the numbness that occurs in your mouth. And we do use this for some of our patients. It's a handy dandy tool. Again, unfortunately, a little bit more expensive than regular local anesthetic. And um, you have to be careful with your shelf life on it. So if you're going to buy a bundle and then you don't go through it, it's a bit of a waste of money. So this is a simple picture of our suction. Um, the reason I put this here, the average dental office, has what we call a high-speed suction, which is this one. And then the secondary one would be the one that has um, the little curved, um, we call it a saliva ejector, in there. Um, one of the first changes we made in the clinic, and I would recommend this for anybody who takes care of patients with disabilities a lot, is to take away the saliva ejector and set up two high-speed suctions. And I'll show you what we do with that in a moment. So this is a pretty easy modification for um, the, 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 um, the, I want to call them maintenance guys. I can't think of the name of the company that provides services for our dental units. But this right here, if you can see where I'm mousing, is the opening for another product called an Isolite, which I'll also show you. So for those of you that have spent any time in an operating room setting, this is called a Yankauer suction. Oral surgeons use them often. Um, this is our go-to suction in our clinic. Unfortunately, this adapter end does not fit in, aha, it won't let me go backwards. There we go, in there. So we have to put this little metal connector in there. And that fits in there. And this puts it all together. And then it looks like that. And it enables us to have this very skinny tipped, more um, um, powerful suction to help manage Many of, uh, many of our patients have a lot of secretion. We use quite a bit of sedation, so it's important that we have accurate suction. These are just some of the other tricks of the trade. If any of you are interested in um, seeing some of the other products that we use, this is called a mulch mouth prop. We put these little cushions on the lips so that this metal, I'm, on, I'm sorry, the cushions go on here so the metal doesn't pinch the lip. Um, you know, I'm a bargain shopper. Anybody? can take a guess. I'll give you a hint. It's in your chem lab. Yes, this is the tubing that goes to the Bunsen burner. You bought a big long piece of it and cut it in sections. And then they fit on there like that. And that avoids pinching the patient's lip. This is another mouth prop. Sorry, you can't read the words really well. It says McKesson mouth prop. It's just a brand. Tie a little piece of floss in there. And then you put it in the mouth. These are different retractors that we use. Many of our patients have very large tongues difficult to see the teeth. This is one of the ways we help to retract. This is a really handy dandy tool that's made by a um, specialized care company. So this green portion is similar to that McKesson. The difference is it has this little handle. So the patient's teeth will be right here on these little bumpy parts. And this part actually is external to the mouth. So it enables you to hold it in position once you get in, in place. Um, believe it or not, most of us don't like to have our teeth cleaned, right? And patients with disabilities are no different. And they resist and they turn. And it's, it's pretty difficult to get a mouth prop in in the first place. And once you get it in, it's nice to have a hold on it. So that enables us to do that. 
this little thing is enable the hole here is enabling us to add a suction there, which we typically do not do. And the hole goes through to the, the other side. You'll see it right there. So this is called an isolate. Some of you in the dental field may be familiar with this. This end hooks to the suction, where I showed you on that other um, picture with the three suctions. And this all gets built together. That just shows you the underside of it. These little snake fang looking things will fit into the next piece. This portion is disposable, like it says, comes in five sizes. And on the opposite side of this are the little holes that those snake fangs fit into. And when it's all put together, it looks like this. This provides a mouth prop right here. This is similar to that McKesson. This is added to the suction, so it's providing suction the whole time that it's in the mouth. There are little openings in here that the saliva can go through. And you can also have a light source illuminate the entire mouth with this imposition. So this is sort of what it looks like when it's in the mouth. I think there's another, yeah, there's a little closer picture. So this little button up here controls the light. And I don't have the light on because it didn't take a very good picture with the light on. But it illuminates the whole inside of the mouth, which is absolutely wonderful. So those of you in the dental field, if you haven't had the opportunity to use one of these, it's a wonderful product. From what I understand, many of the dental schools are now providing an ISOVAC, which is, this is like the Cadillac version, the ISOLITE. The ISOVAC is, is a step-down version. It doesn't have the light. The light is the portion that makes this um, bugger a little bit expensive. Rubber dam, if any of you had any dentistry done or those of you in the dental field know that the rubber dam is the go-to way to provide care for um, many situations in the mouth. So it can be very helpful with patients um, who have um, oral issues. Um, but there are certainly a list of cons. The patient needs to be able to oper or cooperate for the whole thing. We have many who are mouth breathers and gaggers and things like that. Um, and it can act as an airway obstruction if the patient's receiving sedation. It needs to be used with caution, but we do routinely use it. OK, sorry, I had to catch a drink there. This is another product made by Specialized Care Company. This is a surround toothbrush. And it's difficult to see in this picture, but there are actually three sets of toothbrush bristles. So one side is brushing the part of your tooth towards your cheek, the other portion towards your tongue. And in between these two slanted sets of bristles are actually a little set of short stubby bristles that are brushing the biting surface of your teeth or the occlusals of your teeth. And these are mouth props that they are um, made by the same company. So uh, we promote these a lot with our patients. Um, and so they would put the mouth prop in on one side and basically just scrub the other side. You were probably all taught to brush the outside, then the inside, then the biting surface, and take your time and take two, three minutes to brush your teeth. When you have a moving target for a patient, you just need to cover as much surface area as you can. This is that company and their contact information. And if this works, I might be able to drag this over here. There's a whole website devoted to this. They have a wonderful line of products. I have nothing to do with this company. I'm not promoting them because I benefit from it, anything um, you know, um, on my side of the equation. But I just want you to be aware of the fact they have many positioners and things like that. You can see this young man is being stabilized with some things. They also make the traditional papoose, which some of you may be familiar with. They call it the rainbow wrap. Sounds so much nicer than a papoose. Um, they also provide, I mean, sell numerous um, positioners for the neck and things like that. And we buy one that I call the bean bag, which many of our patients are very tiny and they just slither all around in the dental chair. I can't seem to find a picture of that. I think it's in this category. Um, and it's rather comfortable. It is not. I can't find my bean bag kit positioner, but it's a huge cushion that goes in the chair. And there it is. Doesn't that look comfortable? So it helps to stabilize the patient. So let me get that out of the way. Anyway, there's their contact information if you'd like to look at their products. Taking x-rays is rather challenging on this patient population. Um, this is called a nomad. For those of you that are not familiar with it, it's basically like x-rays in a box. So you can carry this right up to the patient's face. It is not a mount, mounted to the wall like most traditional x-ray devices. 
and um, you can take the pictures, the radiographs, rather quickly. We use the digital sensors um, setup, which many dental offices have now. Ooh, blurry. I apologize. So this little um, multi-positional tab enables you to take a full series of radiographs without having to take the tab in and out of the mouth. For those of you that are dentists, this is for the bite wing position. This is for the posterior um, periapical position and for the anterior periapical position. And so what you can't see well, because this is blurry and I apologize, there's like a little train track in here. And this little tab just slides along that. And this shows it in use. So this is a post position. When we do this, the providers are also wearing lead aprons, because obviously they're in the in the room with the x-rays being taken. So some folks might wonder how you get a patient to bite down when they're being sedated. And we use our wrist restraints, which is just a soft cloth, and use it to position it and then have the patient, well, we bite down for them. They don't bite. And that just shows you that the image shows up pretty much immediately. OK, this is another thing that becomes very handy. This is a Hoyer lift, and it enables us to move a patient from their wheelchair into the dental chair. This isn't the best patient or um, picture. This patient actually needed to be in the next size of sling. You can see he's sort of pouring out of it. But um, you can see we're repositioning him in his wheelchair. He had slid, in that, slid down in the wheelchair. Um, and this enabled us to just lift him up and reposition him in there. So I tell the students it's like a ferret in a hammock. And it helps us to pick the patients up. This is a, this is a device called a VersaTilt. The patient is actually in their own wheelchair. It is not a reclinable wheelchair. And the device enables us to tip that wheelchair to provide care. And you can see that the provider can either be sitting or standing. OK, so um, I had a whole list of other procedures in here to talk about, but we're not going to go through all that. I did want to mention endodontic procedures. So for those of you that aren't dentists, that's root canals. So um, just to get everybody on the same page, when a patient needs a root canal, usually there are certain signs and symptoms that you're aware of that would indicate you need to have the root canal done. The tooth becomes more sensitive to hot and cold and percussion, biting down, things like that. Well, now take that same situation and apply it to a patient with a, a disability and they're nonverbal or they have a verbal impairment. So in the way we manage that, and I'm just using this as an example of a modification to care, if somebody is unable to report their own pain, we often have the um, have to have the care provider, mom, dad, whoever, make a big decision in advance. So if you have a deep enough cavity that encroaches on the pulpal tissue, the nerve in the tooth, rather than waiting for the tooth to become symptomatic, because that could be very bad for many of our patients. Their behavior becomes erratic, and life becomes very difficult for everybody. Um, sometimes we do elective endodontic procedures or root canals. So um, and then you have to weigh the pros and cons, just like you would for every other patient. Um, unfortunately, many of the tests we use, which is this little list right here for those of you that are non-dentists, some of our patients can't um, cooperate for this testing or can't differentiate when I'm tapping on this tooth. Does it feel more different or more painful than the tooth next to it? So a lot of the tools that we use to, use to make a diagnosis are limited. And I'm sure the physicians on the phone are very aware of that um, similar scenario um, in their field. So these are just some other endodontic procedures. Um, but I mostly put this slide in here because we ask the parents and caregivers, is the patient able to report their own discomfort? Will you know if they're in pain? I personally think it's a crime that the patients might have a toothache and nobody knows. And all they know is they're having a behavior. And that behavior could be related to a bad tooth, a bad ear, or like in the presentation last month, perhaps they're severely constipated. Extractions are an issue with patients um, that don't understand how to follow post-op instructions in terms of sutures and bleeding and things like that. So that's another consideration. And then, you know, this is just kind of pulling it all together with how you put your treatment plan together. Lots of treatment suggestions and definitely a team approach. You're not typically only dealing with the patient. It's the whole world that comes with that patient. Um, 
a lot of times we manage patients with fun things like singing and stuff like that. We've gotten through appointments with all kinds of interesting things and behavior modification techniques. So let's look at a patient. So this is one of our patients, and her name is Abby, and she is 24. I've known Abby for about four years now, maybe a little longer. So here's Abby. Isn't she adorable? So um, when you um, have a disability, you can stay in high school a little bit longer. So the bonus for Abby was she got to go to the senior prom twice. So the picture on the left is when she went um, stag. And then the year after that, when she was really her last time to be a senior and going to her last senior prom, her brother's friend um, took her to the prom. And um, the picture I wasn't able to get was one of the two of these two, the, the two of them dancing, which was really adorable. Difficult to see, but down, down here you see her shoes. These are actually just modified tennis shoes, as are these, which mom has put a lot of bling on, and they're nice and shiny. So this is for the crowd. I would like you to look at this list of meds that Abby is on. And I know we can't talk back and forth, but I want you to, particularly the students and residents, to look at this list of meds and start to create in your head what some of Abby's medical problems might be. And then we'll start to go through them. So this section here all goes together. I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. We have a couple here that go together. This is kind of one that's floating by itself, maybe, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. And we have uh, several in this area that go together. So this is where I think it would be really cool if we could talk to each other. But So this section of meds is all um, anticonvulsants. So what I try to teach our students and residents is you can look at a list of meds before you look at the patient's med history. And you should be able to get a perspective on what type of medical problems they have. So looking at this list of meds here, these are her daily meds. Okay, Not everybody takes all those daily that has a seizure disorder, but Abby needs all of them. So that tells you her seizure disorder is significant. And this is a rectal suppository. So if she has a seizure that lasts more than five minutes, they use that. Okay. So then down here we have some um, GERD management meds, omeprazole, Prilosec. I'm sure many of you have heard of those meds. So we know she has some GI issues or some GERD issues. Low estrin. So she's on an estrogen to help manage her cycles. And it's not just for convenience. And it's not because she's sexually active. Um, this mom, I told you, I learned things from parents. This mom is one of several moms that helped me to realize that managing the ebb and flow of the estrogen cycle helps to manage the seizures for many females that have seizure disorders. Something I never learned in dental school. And again, something I learned from my mom. Synthroid, so I think we can suspect she has some hypothyroidism. Um, these are antihistamines, so she's got some things going on with her nasal drainage that makes her unhappy. Or, in her case, she has excessive nasal drainage contributes significantly to her inability to breathe correctly, which is why we see the albuterol in here. Abby does not have asthma, but she definitely has um, limited respiratory drive. Scopolamine patch. So some of you may know of scopolamine as a medicine that helps to manage nausea and or vomiting. In Abby's case, it's being used to help manage her heavy oral secretion. She has enough saliva for about five typical patient. And because she's an aspiration risk, that is incredibly um, important for them to manage that. And then you can see from this list of um, stool softeners and stool management type of meds that she um, has issues with constipation, which we heard about last month. She's on some vitamin D, partially because she lives in Pittsburgh and we never get sunshine, but also because, as we've learned from uh, I believe it was a lecture I heard from Dr. Fisher, if I'm not mistaken, at one of the ADMD meetings, that the vitamin D is not absorbed correctly in the gut when many of these seizure meds are used. 
and the chlorhexidine gluconate is something that we have her on to help manage her mouth, her bacterial plaque. So here's Abby. So she has cerebral palsy. She also has a seizure disorder, Lenogastel syndrome. And um, in her case, it presents itself as grand mal seizures, often up to four or five times a day. She has a vagal nerve stimulator. So in addition to all those meds to help manage her seizures, she also has a vagal nerve stimulator to help manage the seizures. She has an intellectual disability, and they've um, determined that it's from lysencephaly, which I have another slide about. There's the or hypothyroidism. She now has a feeding tube. She's nonverbal. She also is um, incontinent in terms of the bladder and is typically very constipated. Um, but when she finally gets relief, she has no control of her bowels either. She's able to walk a short distance with some assistance, and she needs support. Um, prior to a recent episode a couple years ago, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes, she was able to, little, to walk a, a bit more. Um, she has a type of walking that is sort of the tippy toe with her knees tipped in. And you now I believe that that's referred to as toe walking. And it's pretty classic for a patient with um, cerebral palsy. Here's a little more details about Leno Gestel. So um, in her case, the intellectual disability is accompanied with it. And also, like I mentioned, in her case, it's mostly grand mal seizures. But it does present with multiple different types of seizures in different patients. Um, you can see it is not a common source of childhood epilepsies, but that it does persist into adult years. And um, sometimes they're not quite sure why it happened. The next slide does, um, I'm sorry, this goes into that. Oh, I thought I had another slide about that. Um, so lysencephaly means smooth brain. So rather than having the normal um, convoluted areas on the brain, the surface of the brain, of the brain is almost completely smooth. And they're, um, um, we're identifying some of the, co the potential causes, injury to the fetus during development, also common in cerebral palsy, um, possibly insufficient blood flow to the brain, again, possibly similar to cerebral palsy, and uh, viral infections, which occasionally if that, that occurs when, um, so we teach the students the, the cause of cerebral palsy can either be prenatal, perinatal, or postnatal. So if it's during, um, while the baby's still in utero, mom has a significant viral infection, it could cause um, a developmental disability in the child. Sorry, it went too far. Okay. So this is Abby, July of 2013. She was going in for a routine procedure for her VNS replacement. The sedation went fine, is what mom told me. Unfortunately, after the sedation, Abby was having difficulty eating and refused to eat and also refused to take her meds. Her meds were mostly liquids. And um, at that time, she did not have a feeding tube. Because the meds were not being given um, as they should be, she had a severe seizure episode, actually um, status epilepticus, ended up losing her airway, needed to be intubated, and they eventually had to give her a tracheostomy, which um, it might have been longer than two weeks. I have two weeks on here. Um, then she ended up needing the G-tube in that amount of time so that they could at least manage her meds and start to give her nourishment. She was in the hospital for quite a long time, much of that time in the ICU. And then she followed um, from there into a rehab, rehab um, rehabilitation area in, in the Pittsburgh area that's called Children's Institute. So mom's verbiage to me was, we almost lost her. It was an incredibly scary situation for them. Um, prior to this episode, we were already treating Abby. And um, because of mom's previous reports about sedation being difficult, and Abby, Abby has a relatively cooperative attitude when it comes to the dentistry. So we would do the best we could with several of us helping and um, get her teeth cleaned. Now we definitely don't sedate her because of um, the complications from all of this. Sorry, my slide wasn't advancing. There we go. So this is how we manage Abby. 
Um, like I said, we don't use any sedation. We do use quite a bit of sedation for many of our patients, but Abby, we have never sedated. Um, there are times when we've transferred her to the dental chair, which she managed to slither out of almost, so then we have to reposition her. Mom's preference is that we treat her in her wheelchair and we tip the wheelchair back. Thankfully, it's a reclinable wheelchair. Um, that's another modification that's very helpful in dental practice. If you have the ability to design your own dental practice, keep in mind it's helpful to have at least one operatory where you can move the dental chair out of the way, have it free from the floor so that it can be removed completely out of the way, and provide care for patients in their wheelchairs. And we even have the ability to provide care for patients on gurneys. So um, we talked about Abby's excessive secretions. So we wouldn't want that small saliva ejector that you all might be used to from the dental office. Some of us call it Mr. Thirsty as a joke. Um, with Abby, we just go straight to the Ankauer suction. I apologize. Um, and like I said, it typically takes about four of us to manage her. So including mom, mom holds her hands. Mom has a beautiful voice. Mom sings to her almost the whole time we're working. And we have three um, providers on the dental side of the equation. One is the doer, the primary provider, and typically two assistants. One helping to hold that mouth prop in place and stabilize her head, and the other one keeping that suction running continuously. Um, she does have heavy gagging. We have to be really careful because of her GERD and her other GI issues. She could basically gag to the point of throwing up. Clearly, we don't want her doing that. Um, um, and radiographs are rather difficult. We have yet to successfully take them um, in the dental clinic. The films that I do have are from a time that she was in the OR prior to coming to see us. And then she also sat for a Panorex, which some of you may have had that picture taken yourself. Um, and, and it's not the best quality Panorex. Our radiology department almost deleted it, but we said, nope, it got the information I needed. I wanted to know if she had wisdom teeth. And the pan, even though it was a little blurry because she moved, enabled us to see that she doesn't have any wisdom teeth on the bottom. Two less concerns to worry about. Um, she does have upper wisdom teeth, and they're very superior in position. So we're certainly not going to tackle them um, yet. That's just one less thing for us to worry about right now. What I forgot to tell you about somewhere along the line, uh, yeah, there was definitely another slide. I apologize. Um, when they had, um, one of the times that Abby was in to see us, we noticed that her right tonsil was appreciably larger than the left one. So we took some photos of it while she was in the, in the dental office. Mom took those, extra, or those photographs to the ENT so they could assess it. Um, he did an evaluation on Abby. I'm not quite sure how. And they determined that um, she has partial paralysis of her vocal cords. And so I think that's helping to explain why um, she still needs the feeding tube. They've not been able to get her to um, swallow correctly since that 2013 hospitalization. She's been tube fed since then. So dental folks and non-dental folks, um, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Think about what the mouth looks like when somebody is eating through a tube 100% of the time. The food bypasses the mouth completely and goes directly into whichever portion of the GI tract. It's either a G-tube or a GJ tube or whichever type they um, determine is necessary. One of the significant findings is that they typically, these patients get much more calculus in their mouth. So it's just the opposite of what you would think. And unfortunately, it's just the opposite of what many parents think. They think, oh, they're not my patient. My son, my daughter is not eating you know, orally. They can't possibly have much dental um, plaque. And that is actually not the case. So the um, act of eating, food rubbing on your teeth is an act of debridement. It's a mechanical debridement technique that we all take for granted. Um, and so fortunately for Abby, she does not get a lot of heavy calculus. So if she did, I'm afraid we would probably have to sedate her to be able to get that off safely without having her aspirate pieces of calculus into our airway. Um, that does happen with many of our patients. And so 
we do, you know, from time to time, we do have to provide intubation, sedation um, to be able to protect the airway during treatment. Anyway, so, you know, sometimes dentists regress back to their barber days. And this is just an example of a fellow who does not tolerate the buzz of the razor. So the hands that you see with the pinky purple sweater, those are moms. Um, we just finished doing dentistry on this young man on this day. And when we're done and while before he's 100% awake, um, mom comes in and gives him a little, a little haircut. So, all right, I guess it's time for questions. And I think, Mike, will you manage that? Yes? That is correct. So now if anyone has questions uh, and they would like to submit them, we are open. Um, I also realized that I did not share with you all the graphics um, for the polls that we took earlier. So I'll throw those up on the, on the screen just so you can see what I discussed earlier. So right there, you can just see like the distribution of who has joined us tonight. Once again, I'll say there's 12% administration, 15% students, 8% medicine, and 31% dentistry, and 35% others. So it's pretty evenly distributed. I think that um, this is certainly an educational um, presentation for myself because I wasn't aware of many of the topics that Dr. Takelet discussed. Uh, so hopefully people who are participating and listening in also took the same away from it. Michael, share with us how much med dentistry you get in med school. Um, <laughs> we learn about the nervous system and as it relates to dentistry and how, or how it relates to the teeth but and the anatomy of the teeth, but so far uh, I haven't really learned much other than that. <laughs> kind of frustrating for us because we learn a ton of medicine. I believe it. And so here's also the stage in career that the participants are coming from. Uh, largely currently practicing, 71%, 4% residency, and then 25% health profession training. Oh, so we have some questions. All right. So is there any way to encourage chewing motion with clients who are tube fed? Huh. Good question. Well, many of our clients who are tube fed are, um, not all of them, but many of them are patients who have cerebral palsy. And interestingly enough, um, m most of the cerebral palsy patients ha have significant grinding habits. Um, so. Um, and many of those patients also chew on their fingers or their hands. One of the really cool things that I've noticed with the younger patients is that many of them now chew on, I call them chew toys. I don't mean to make it sound like a canine, but there's an entire catalog that has, I mean, there's a, cha a catalog that has an entire chapter devoted to chewing devices, chewable devices for patients with disabilities because they will mouth something, many of them. And instead of them biting their own hands and scarring and, and, and hurting their own hands, if they're taught very young to use these chewing devices, then it eliminates a lot of the damage to their own hands and arms and things like that. So I think that a lot of the chewing is there. It's just not um, the same as having food rubbing on your teeth. Um, I've, I'm still bewildered how some patients like Abby don't get that much when she eats nothing orally and other patients get a lot. And I, I have to go back to attributing it to mom's diligence in, a, in a, an example like um, Abby. So, but that was a good question. Yeah, um, I think they get a lot of oral stim on some of these chewing devices. Um, I wish more care facilities would provide them. Um, one thing worth pointing out on this picture right now, this white mouth prop. Can you still see the slide? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Hold on. Let me, let me hide this. Okay. So 
There we go. Some of our facilities are now considering this mouth pop a restraint. Hmm. And they won't allow the care provider to use the mouth prop to brush the teeth. And it's incredibly frustrating for us. My classic line is, you know, uh, they tell me they're allowed to refuse to have this done. And my classic line is, okay, so does he wear a diaper? And I'll say, yeah. If he messes in his diaper, are you allowed to mildly restrain him to change his pants? Typically, I get told, that's different. <laughs> that's hygienic. Guess what? Your mouth is way dirtier than almost anything else on your person. And getting the point across that bacterial plaque is, you know, a causative agent in heart disease and diabetes and aspiration pneumonia and all of those other things. It's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult point to get across. Dentistry is pretty low on the totem pole. So that was a big tangent. Uh, Any other questions? Yes. Um, so. We have a question about plaque accumulation and calculus in patients fed intranasally. So since there's no food getting into the mouth um, and the bacteria aren't being fed uh, in the same way, is the calculus composed of a different microflora? Ha! Huh. Excellent question. Must be a dental person. Must um, I'm teasing. <laughs> yes, there yeah. are lots of flora in the mouth, and some of the flora is more decay prone and some is more calculus prone, and the question person is correct. It is a different set of bacteria. Um, most of us have some of those bugs on both sides of that equation. We all, you know, maybe we get a few cavities, we get a little bit of gum disease. Some patients, neurotypical or non-neurotypical, have a spectrum that goes one way or the other. In terms of decay, you need bacterial plaque, which we all own, I hate to admit it, but we all own, plus carbohydrates. So that's the missing piece for a patient that is exclusively tube fed. They don't get carbohydrates in their mouth. Their decay rate is very low. So that is the, like one of the only good things about that phenomenon. Later in life, as they start to get gum recession, um, unfortunately the same bugs that like to make bacteria that cause Calculus also um, often cause root decay. So once the roots are exposed, if somebody gets recession, then you have an issue there. But good question. Yeah, we actually have a bunch of good questions. Um, this is a, a, just a quick one. If someone's looking to find uh, a dentist that could treat um, their child with an intellectual disability, what resource, how would, how would you instruct them to find one? So a lot of children's hospitals, so we're talking about a child, all right, yep. which is actually a little easier answer. So um, most of the children's hospitals in the bigger um, metropolitan areas have a resource for a dental clinic either in their facility or are aware of one. That would be a good first place to go. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what the patient's disability is, say for example if they have Down syndrome, they can contact their local down sport group. Um, same with Autism Speaks, those types of things. Um, it's actually more difficult to find resources for adult patients with disabilities when it comes to dentistry. Cool. Great, thank you. Um, all right, here's another more medically based question. If someone needs a root canal under sedation, where would they go? The medical providers and medical schools are not doing them. Where do you look? I should guess it's not more medical, but it's similar. okay. Say that again, please. Yeah, uh, if someone needs a, if someone needs a root canal under sedation, do they need to go to a specific facility? Um, the question asker said that medical providers and medical and medical schools are not doing them. So where should they look? So I think the question is more dental schools. Um, depends on the school, depends on the state. Um, you know, our school provides that, but not all do. So um, again, that would be something you would have to do your homework and look around and see who's going to provide sedation. Many private practice endodontists, um, root canal specialists, will have dental, dental anesthesiologists come in and provide sedation for them if needed. 
Hmm. Um, will they treat somebody with a disability? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. So dental anesthesiology is becoming a big field now. So they're getting more and more out there, and they almost always are providing anesthesia for dental procedures as opposed to medical procedures. Gotcha. So here's another one. Since many children with ID may have sleep issues, many of these children use pacifiers much longer. Do you give different recommendations to parents of children with ID on pacifier use, especially as a child who can't sleep places extra stress on the parents? Okay. Good question. I'm not a pediatric dentist. Our clinic is about adults, but I can still answer this. I do see a couple. Um, I have a couple pediatric patients in my faculty practice that are personal friends of our family. Um, the one young man is six and still uses a passy. Um, he still can't drink. He eats what she calls mishmash. Um, he uses the passy. That's how she gets his liquid meds in him. He's been through a lot of surgical procedures and a lot of treatment, and the passy gets him through. I'm going to be honest with you. Before I focused my career on treating patients with disabilities, I was an adamant, your kids should not have a passy after the age of two kind of dentist. I have a different opinion about that now. Mm. Um, if that is the calming thing, and that's what gets them through life, guess what? That malocclusion or the bad bite that's going to be developed because of the pacifier is probably not the biggest battle that that young man's going to have to endure. Mm. I have a new perspective. Yeah. Um, here's another one. For clients who are tube fed, what are you recommending? Low foaming toothpaste or just CHS, CHX mouth rinse? Um, actually, most of our patients that are tube fed, we don't have them rinse. We have the um, care provider, mom, dad, whoever, dip that surround toothbrush that I'm showing on the slide there into. Um, a small cup full of the chlorhexidine and actually scrub it on the teeth. And if they are, you know, if they have a uh, suction accessible, they suction simultaneously. I've actually gotten so, um, uh, I don't know what the word is. I write, I write for suction machines as a prescription now, even though I'm not a physician. If somebody is truthfully an aspiration risk, and I feel that they should have a suction in their home. The suction device is not that expensive. And if I can get that for them by blaming it on the dentistry, then hey, yay, yay. And then they have it to clean their teeth too. They'll, you know, they can use the surround brush and the chlorhexidine and suction their mouth while they're doing it, like we do it when we're, we're in here. But then they would also have it if they really needed it for, you know, an aspiration risk patient. So. Um, toothpaste is fine. The dental people sort of know this. As an adult, there's not really that big of a concern about swallowing toothpaste. Uh -huh. When patients are young, you don't want them to swallow excessive fluoride because it will eventually discolor their teeth intrinsically, not extrinsically. But as an adult, that is not the case. Probably the worst case scenario would be they'd get a tummy ache. But if you use a small amount, it won't it won't be impactful. Gotcha. Um, I guess the short story to that is it depends on what the patient tolerates. How's that say? The patient's the boss. That makes sense. What is the choice of dentrifice you recommend? Not sure. That's asking the toothpaste question. Okay. <laughs> Denif den denifrace is like what kind of toothpaste? Same thing. You know, honestly, patients on the autistic spectrum, tastes are a big thing. Some of them cannot tolerate mint. Others hate fruit. So again, it's what the patient tolerates. If it's too foamy, then maybe you get the paste instead of the gel, you know, that kind of thing. Parents have to experiment a lot. Many of our parents use, use kiddo toothpaste on adults because that's what the patient tolerates. There's another one. Honestly, I'm just happy they brush their teeth. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have to have any toothpaste. I don't care. It's the mechanical debridement. 
So, what is that? Hmm. Must be a question that's stumping you. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out how to ask it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, in patients that are fed intraorally versus, um, I believe, in comparison to tube fed, is there a difference in prevalence of periodontitis? You broke up a little bit. I'm sorry. What did you say? That's all right. In patients that are fed intraorally um, versus patients that are tube fed, is there a difference in pre prevalence of periodontitis? That's a pretty, pretty widespread answer. So on patients that are fed intraorally, is there a greater prevalence of periodontitis? Okay, so for the non-dental folks, just to let you know, gingivitis and periodontitis are two different beasts. Um, gingivitis is inflammation of the gum, all right? Most of us have a little bit of it. Periodontitis is actually the bone loss. So frank bone loss occurs as a result of a combination of things. Host response is a part of it. The bacterial load is a piece of it. Um, poor oral hygiene obviously contributes to it. So eventually, gingivitis that's unkept will turn into a situation that's causing bone loss. And over time, that patient will have periodontitis. There are populations of patients with disabilities that are very known to have a greater incidence of bone loss and gum disease, and specifically patients with Down syndrome. Their, their immune response is different, and so that host piece of it, remember I said there was a piece of it that's about the host response, their inflammatory reaction is greater than most of ours. So the same amount of crud on a tooth causes more inflammation, and unfortunately they are also notorious for very short-rooted teeth, so they're not in the bone as far as most other folks' teeth are. And the combination of those two things causes them to lose their teeth much more rapidly. Um, so that's an example of somebody who does have an issue with increase in periodontal disease, regardless of whether they're fed orally or fed through a tube. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I answered that correctly. Um, um, basically, gum disease and decay is all related to the same cause, bacterial plaque, unkept bacterial plaque, and then host response, and all those other things we just talked about. Gotcha. Did that help? Maybe they can clarify their question if they type again. Let's see. Someone else asked in the meantime, um, if you make a comment on the move about some states Medicaid programs that no longer are paying for dental service, or are there other resources um, for payment for service that the government are offering? Mm. Well, private private insurances um, sometimes. Um, um, I, I, we have a few patients that I'm not sure if their patients, their parents are passed away or whatever. But they actually have like a little, um, oh, what's what I want to say? I want to say a fund, but that's not the word I'm thinking of. Um, like, yeah, like a trust fund set aside for them. Um, there aren't a lot of resources, unfortunately. And, you know, like medicine, dentistry is expensive. So it's, it's, it's rather frustrating. Um, we're kind of spoiled here because of the whole Medicaid, Medicare thing in Pennsylvania. Um, but they have cut back quite a bit on what they cover even in our state. They'll cover basic level, what I call level one care. Exams, cleanings, x-rays, fillings, extractions. Pretty much that's it. They don't cover root canals. They don't cover crowns. Um, those kinds of things. 
Gotcha. I forget what the original question was. Oh, any other resources? I think that varies from state to state, honestly. Yeah. All right, let's take one or two more. Um, are there any specific recommendations for Cavitron use in this population? Ha, huh, great question. Well, depends on the patient tolerance. Um, and we use it a lot, but I'm going to be honest with you, most of the patients that we use it with are sedated and their airway is protected. So possibly they're intubated, we have a throw pack in, we have that isolate in place. Um, even if they're not intubated, their airway is protected with the isolate and all of the suction. Part of the reason why we got rid of the saliva ejector on the su suction is to be able to have the typical suction, the high speed suction you guys will know as, as the white tipped one and, um, and the Yankauer simultaneously. So um, you can train your assistant if you're the provider or if you're the hygienist, you will probably need an assistant to um, suction more diligently than you would in somebody who um, could manage all that in their mouth, all that water in their mouth. So for the, those of you that are non-dental, a Cavitron vibrates and squirts water and helps us get calculus off more quickly. So when somebody has significant calculus, it's less work on our hands, less um, you know, uh, trauma to our hands to do it by hand, and a faster procedure so it enables you to get done more quickly. Um, but it squirts a decent amount of water and it's a huge learning process for our students to learn how to use that without causing a laryngeal spasm if somebody's having an open airway sedation. So they learn how to work in teams really well because that's one of the primary reasons. Neat. So it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, so just wanted to point everyone's attention to uh, the chat box. I just sent the link to the survey. Um, if you wouldn't mind, we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that survey out. It really helps us out. Um, and if you lose it, then it's also going to be sent to you tomorrow in an email, a follow-up email from GoToWebinar. Uh, Dr. Takelet, if you don't have anything else, I'd like to thank you for presenting for us tonight. I do not have anything else. Thank you for the